Welcome. For those of you who are new here, my name is Tan, and this is my animal room. All right, real quick before we get started, I just wanna give you a quick rundown on everything in here just so that you know where stuff is. Got the spider vivarium there, terrarium computer desk, and terrariums. We're not talking about any of that. We got the 150 cube, working on that soon. And we've got aquariums here, patio pond, aquariums. We've got the Saranam toad tank, 600 gallon, 40 gallon rack, reptile rack, 75 rack, empty 75, we'll talk about that later, and the 350 gallon paludarium. One more thing real quick before we get started here. I've been keeping amphibians, reptiles, and fish for pretty much my entire life. Everything that you're about to see here is the combination of years worth of effort, research, and experimentation to do the best that I can to provide awesome homes for the animals that I love. I just want to throw that out there real quick though because I've been doing it for 22 plus years and a lot of people seem to think this stuff happens overnight and it really doesn't. I've been working at this for a really long time and I'm so excited to share this tour with you because I know that a lot of you, you've been requesting it for quite a while. So here's the state of the animal room as of 2021. Wait, if you wouldn't mind also hitting the video with a thumbs up, I'd really appreciate it. This is going to be at least an 80 plus hour endeavor. Thanks. I think the best place to start is over here with the first nano rack. This neat area currently houses a lot of my smaller enclosures, but it's a work in process. I built the stand itself out of 2x4s, 2x3s, and plywood. It's actually not complete though because I want to put a little wooden strip here on the front just to make things look a little bit more dialed in. You may be thinking though, what's up with all that empty space over there? Well, I actually recently took down two setups that were over there to make room for new and improved ones. There of course was the Upflow Overflow Aquarium and the Skyscraper Paludarium. The aquarium, as I said in the build video, was a little bit of a prototype. I had it set up for several months and I was really enjoying it, but there were a few things about it that were annoying me and I decided, you know what, it's time to make the new and improved version of this. So I recently took it down and I'll be working on that here soon. As for the paludarium, I've been thinking for a while now that it's been set up for a few years and I think it's time to do something new. I'm really excited for what I have planned for that, but what about the setups that I have up and running right now? Up top we have the Blackwater Tetra Tank. Now of all of the setups I have in the room, this is actually probably one of the more natural ones. Sure, I get a lot of inspiration from nature, I use live plants and natural elements and things, but if you were to actually go underwater and look at where these fish are in nature, this is really similar to something that you'd actually see. A lot of tannins in the water, botanicals down in the bottom, algae, sparse plantings, that sort of thing. I think it has a really cool vibe to it that's largely due to the hardscape. Even though it looks really intricate with all these roots and things like that, it actually only consists of two pieces of wood. Believe it or not, I actually found these locally while I was digging for a pond at my parents' house. I unearthed them and I thought to myself, you know what, these would be absolutely incredible in a setup. So I boiled them for a few hours to remove pathogens or anything like that and built the entire tank around them. And yes, I know I'm a crazy man for doing it, but I purposefully put all of that duckweed up in the top. First and foremost, I really just like how it looks. The roots hanging down in the water add for a pretty cool look, and they of course shade it up on top which adds to that black water effect. They also help with nutrient export and will keep the tank a little bit cleaner. As for the tank itself, I custom built it out of quarter inch thick glass that I salvaged from old aquariums. I don't know about you, but the tannic black water look in an aquarium is really appealing to me. I utilize it in a few of my tanks, but it's definitely most prominent in this one. Unfortunately, at this point, the driftwood has pretty much stopped leaching tannins, so I have to take matters into my own hands. I just steep some Marie Boss tea, let it cool, and add it to the tank to get this look. I may also make some for myself in the process because I really enjoy how it tastes. Just to be clear though, you can't put any old tea in your aquarium. As far as I know, this is the only one that's safe to use. Anyway, I don't only add tannins for aesthetics, the fish really enjoy it as well. Even though this tank looks desolate at first glance, it's absolutely teeming with fish. There are some x-ray tetras, golden neon tetras, ember tetras, exclamation point rasbora, and pygmy corridoras. Most of them are fairly timid and shy and hide within the scape if I'm near the tank. That is unless it's feeding time. I will say though that the tannins clearly help them feel more at home. 
I assume it sort of acts like a visual barrier, making them less aware of what's going on outside of the tank. It's also inhabited by an army of snails and the yellow Neocaridina shrimp that were in the Upflow Overflow Aquarium. I really enjoy these shrimp and I think they're a welcomed addition to this tank. And that's the beauty of having multiple setups. If I decide that I want to take one down, I can take those inhabitants and add them to a new tank that's already established where they can thrive exactly the same. At this point though, this one's been up and running for about 4 months now and I hope to have it for many more because I can't get enough of this black water look. On the next shelf down, I have two setups, including the Moss Trip Wall Beta Paludarium and the Ghost Shrimp Ghost Ship Aquascape. The Paludarium is an incredible setup that I really think showcases the Beta well. This is Mia, and she's actually my wife's Beta. Anytime I get Betas, I always buy them for the personality, and this one really spoke to me. When I bought her though, it was totally unplanned. About a month prior to that, our other Beta, Ellie, decided to jump out of the tank and passed away. I've kept several bettas over the years and never had this happen before, but it's something I'll definitely be mindful of moving forward. And you can see with this tank I took that into consideration because the waterline is much lower than the top of the tank. Anyway, after I took that setup down, I moved the other fish into the tank you saw previously. I planned on waiting longer to get Alyssa another fish, but I saw Mia at Aquashella and I knew she had to come home with me. She's incredibly beautiful, but her personality was exactly what I expect from a betta active, personable, and wild. So I brought her home and I designed this setup which I think is absolutely perfect for a betta. Upon first glance, I'm sure you could quickly tell that this isn't your standard aquarium. It's a cube that I set up in the paludarium format. There's a pump near the back of the scape that sends water behind a piece of driftwood which then cascades down a moss drip wall. This helps mechanically filter the water and aids in nutrient export. This is also done through the floating plants as I explained in the previous tank and the emergent plant growth. I used a variety of plants that were readily grow in a riparian setting, meaning that they can be grown with their roots submerged in the water and the rest of the foliage growing out of the top. Doing so is one of the most effective means of filtration because of how these plants pull nutrients from the water column. In other words, the things that we typically do water changes for. Plus, in my opinion, they add a lot of depth and make for a really dynamic looking setup. These plants are anchored in place on some driftwood where their roots can then branch down into the water. These create barriers and areas of refuge for Mia to enjoy if she wants to relax. Like the previous tank, I also included leaf litter and other botanicals to make this setup more optimal for the fish. Bettas appreciate a more acidic environment and the humic acids released by the leaves are really beneficial to their health. Another aspect of this tank that really serves no function other than to look cool is that I have a mist maker hooked up to it. Now I don't use it very often, but every now and again I'll plug it in just to make the vibe a little bit cooler. Unfortunately, Mia's going to be the only betta that joins us in this tour because we lost Casper a few months back. I had him for about 3 years, which is pretty typical for a betta's lifespan, so I believe he simply lived out his days. That said, I do believe he would have lived a little bit longer had I got him from a more reputable source like a private breeder or something of that nature, as opposed to one of those big box stores. As you know, they're kept in those little cups and the water conditions are less than ideal, and that can have effects on them later in life. That said, I think I'm done with longfin varieties as well. I'm typically not too crazy about longfin fish in general, but if you watch Mia how she swims through the tank and stuff, it's effortless. Whereas if you see those longfin varieties, they clearly struggle a little bit, and I don't really think that's something I want to support moving forward. Let me get off my soapbox though. I just wanted to discuss that real quick since we were talking about bettas. Oh yeah, one more thing that I almost forgot is that I originally tried to cohab other fish with her, but she was not having it. It's something that you gotta feel out per betta because their temperaments are completely different from fish to fish. Let's move on over to the Ghost Shrimp Ghost Ship Aquascape. This one's definitely unique compared to pretty much everything else you've seen this tour and that it's definitely designed to not look like something natural. Its primary feature is a sunken sailboat that I built out of natural materials and other things that I knew were safe to put in a tank. Although this is not something I typically enjoy, there's something about the way that this one looks in the tank that I find really appealing. I think the fact that it's not made from plastic or something of that nature really helps. It's nestled atop a bed of seiryu stones and other hardscape elements that I think really tie everything together. It also includes a ton of plants, most notably Hygrophila corumbosa. I thought this gave kind of like a kelp or deep sea vibe that really complements the boat. I also have some crypts and Suswasser tongue to fill in the midground. 
Although the planting is pretty dense, I kept it primarily near the back of the scape to really frame everything in. Unfortunately though, some staghorn algae has begun to form on various elements in the tank. I should be able to get it dialed in without issue though. This is a somewhat new tank, so a little bit of algae is to be expected. As for the tank itself, it's just your standard 10 gallon tank that I de-rimmed to match the rest of the tanks. For now it's inhabited by a small group of panda tetras, ghost shrimp, and of course a group of snails. I originally bought these fish to match with the ghost theme, but I really enjoy them after the fact. They have big personalities and a great feeding response. The shrimp on the other hand are pretty cool as well. They just stick to themselves and feverishly scour the tank for whatever they can find. All in all though, I think this is a fun little tank that showcases a different side of the hobby. I'm not sure how long I intend to keep it set up, but in the meantime, I'll enjoy it all the same. The fourth and final setup on this shelf is the Rainbow Shiner River Island Aquascape. This is also a custom built aquarium. I used quarter inch thick glass that I got from a local glass shop. I think it's a pretty cool dimension because it's really not that big of a tank, but due to the length it gives the impression that it is quite large. I also put window frost film on the sides and back for a cleaner aesthetic. All of this lends itself to a different type of scape. As the name suggests, I went for something that sort of resembles an island. Meaning that, I isolated the scape toward the right side of the tank. Over here, I created the primary feature with a stump-like piece of driftwood. I placed various sizes of stones around it to create something that I think looks natural. I also planted the tank primarily in this area for the same reasons. I used plants like Vallisneria and Hydrocaudal that will branch out from the central location and arc over the rest of the scape. The end result is something that I think looks pretty unique and dramatic while also keeping the fish in mind. If they feel the need to hide, there's plenty of area for them to do so on this side of the tank. This rarely happens and they are full of energy, so a large open swimming area is ideal because that's where they spend the majority of their time. Speaking of the fish, this tank was specifically built for a group of rainbow shiners I got a few months back. These are incredibly beautiful fish that are native to the United States. Mine have colored up a little bit since going into this tank, but eventually they'll mature into a bright blue, purple, and red colored fish, especially the males. I also have a group of pearl danios, which in some ways resemble the shiners. The two groups work well together because both are high energy and very peaceful. Like the previous tank, this one also has a crazy feeding response. I absolutely love to watch it, and overall this tank is doing extremely well. There was one unfortunate occurrence with it though, and that's that the rainbow goby decided to jump out. That's obviously my fault because I decided to go with an open top tank. You're probably thinking to yourself though, why didn't you just put lids on these things already so that you don't have this keep happening? In reality, I've been keeping tanks like this for so many years, and it really rarely, if ever, happens. I had those two occurrences, and I honestly can't think of any others on the top of my head where I lost fish due to them jumping out. Regardless, even though I tend to overlook this and really haven't had much issues with it, I feel obliged to tell you about it because it is an actual issue to consider when you're keeping open top tanks like these. Anyway, I can't wait to see how this tank progresses and how the fish will look as they mature. Right on the other side of the wall from where we just were is another aquarium rack and a patio pond. This is another DIY setup that I did myself. It's 2x3s and a few common boards that I put together in a way that has a little bit of a shelf up on top, as well as an area for two tanks underneath. We've got the Low Tech Daniel Community Aquascape up top, the Volcano Rasbora Islandscape below that, and the Guppy Riparian Patio Pond to the right. The riparian pond is especially unique because of how low tech it is, so much so that it doesn't even have a filter. All of the filtration is actually done through the riparian plants, like I described in some of the other setups, most notably this huge philodendron. There are other smaller plants in here as well. Again, these all pull nutrients out of the water in order to build and grow the plants. Periodically trimming the leaves also helps perpetuate and expedite this process once the system is established. I will say though that when running a system like this, it's really important to fertilize the plants after a certain point. Since I use tap water in all of my systems, minerals are replenished when I do water changes. However, this one's a little bit different because I almost never do them. Beside the minerals in the water, the plants are obviously powered by the bioload created by the fish. Once the plants get established and are really robust though, the bioload created by the fish is so minimal compared to what the plants process. 
This is great news for the fish because it means that the water remains very stable with minimal effort on your end. This takes us back to the fertilizer though. After a certain point the plants will deplete pretty much all of the nutrients from the system and they'll start showing deficiencies like this leaf. Now of course you don't need to wait for that to happen but I'd recommend at least waiting a little bit before you do. The crazy thing is though that I've had this set up for almost 6 months and I hadn't fertilized at all until last week. Since then I've had several new leaves pop up and they're looking really good. Anyway, making something like this is fairly easy to do and relatively inexpensive. The main basin here is just a large planter pot. Inside of it I got two terracotta pots. The one on the bottom is used for a riser and the one on top I have filled with substrate for the plants. I drilled holes in the planter so the roots can grow out into the water column and so this isn't wasted space for the fish. The roots also create an incredible network for the fish and fry to live within. As such we've had a few generations of babies pop up in here since I've added the guppies. The first happened shortly after I added them and they're more or less adults now and the second one happened pretty recently. I was really excited to see all of this but it's what you could expect when you're keeping fancy guppies. Since they've bred a few times already and no doubt will continue doing so, I recently added 5 more females in here to increase diversity and minimize inbreeding. At some point I'll inevitably have to start pulling them from this so it doesn't become overpopulated, but for now it could handle a decent amount more. Keeping fish in this way is actually pretty easy and fun to do. The major con is probably pretty obvious though, you're only able to see the fish from overhead. That makes some things a little more challenging, but it's obvious the fish don't care how well you're able to see them. My only caution when working with a system like this, especially if you've never done so already, is to experiment with the plants a little bit first prior to adding the fish. Sometimes plants struggle to acclimate to the riparian conditions and can foul the water. The last thing worth mentioning about this one is that the light that I have overhead here is a deformable LED shop light. I just put it inside of a wicker basket here to make it look a little more appealing. The Danu Aquascape here is one of my favorites because of the awesome jungle vibe. There's a lot of hardscape that's complemented by various plants and a variety of different inhabitants. The largest and most prominent plant is in the dead center, the dwarf aquarium lily. It's a beautiful plant that makes a big impact in just about any tank. If you want to keep it looking pristine though, make sure to add root tabs every now and again. A few other highlights are the Suswasser Tong and Busa Philandra. The hardscape on the other hand consists of Mupani wood and one of my personal favorites, Pagoda Stone. I think the combination of those elements and the plants makes for a really intricate design that gives you a lot to look at. As such, there's always something new to see and enjoy. This intricacy gives the inhabitants so many places to explore and swim around through. In addition to that, the majority of them are quite small, which gives an interesting sense of scale. There are several types of fish in here, including gold ring tenwanai danyo, which are rare and incredibly beautiful. There's a smaller variety of danyo, and who I primarily built this tank for. There's a group of green kabotai rasbora as well. I also have a breeding colony of red cherry shrimp and a few massive amano shrimp. And let's not forget about the snails. I absolutely love them and I gotta include them in just about every tank because they're so beneficial. This tank is a lot of fun and I absolutely love watching it. Despite a little bit of algae here and there, I think it's a pretty attractive scape. I'm sure at some point I'll do a refresh on it, but I don't intend on taking it down anytime soon. Right below it I've got the Volcano Rasbora Island scape. This is probably one of the more striking designs in the entire room. The background consists of a heavily planted forest, which is contrasted by bright white sand in the front. I created this look by building up two islands of sorts in the back of the tank with Hakai stone. This is a really desirable stone to scape with that has an awesome aquamarine hue to it. I think the combination and contrasts of these looks makes for a really unique design. I kept it simple with this tank and it's inhabited by a single group of fish, the Volcano Rasbora. These are fairly uncommon fish that are deceptively beautiful. At first glance you might look at them and think, yeah that's just another random silver fish. Maybe so, but let's take a closer look. As they turn and move around, they have an incredible iridescence about them that reveals a plethora of various subtle colors. These fish are somewhat shy, but they become ravenous once you drop food in the tank. They quickly make it to the top and attack the water's surface like a pack of sharks. That's one of the reasons why I love this tank. I think the fish are really incredible and are showcased so nicely in this setup. 
That said, I do have to get in here and do some serious maintenance. It's been a while since I've trimmed the plants, so the moss is looking kind of stringy, some unsightly leaves and little patches of algae here and there, but all of that can be addressed really easily. So at some point I'll do that, but all in all, I'm really enjoying the progress on this tank. Before we continue on that side of the room, let's go over here real quick and take a look at the jumping spider. This enclosure, like most other things down here in the animal room, is 100% DIY. The tank itself is primarily made out of glass that's assembled like any other enclosure. The difference came when I included pieces of wood to create a door mechanism. It has hinges, a little handle, and magnets that lock the door shut. When I'm making tanks like this, I prefer to have a door that opens up on a hinge like this as opposed to sliders to maximize visibility. The only obstruction on this one is the spaces between the glass. You'll notice that there's a small canopy on top that's outfitted with lights and ventilation to keep it from getting too hot. Inside of the tank is your typical bioactive setup, which I'll discuss more on later. There's leaf litter on the bottom for the cleanup crew, live plants, moss, and of course a custom background. I carved this all out of polystyrene to create a rocky texture. Then I went back and painted it with various layers of drylock latex paint. The end result is something that I think looks reasonably real and makes for a cool looking design. And although I originally designed this for my late ghost mantis, it was a perfect fit for my newly acquired bull jumping spider. As of now, she's still unnamed. But for those of you who are unfamiliar with her story, the way I got her was kind of unexpected. I brought home a plant from a local store and set it in the room behind me. I kept seeing movement on the leaves. Once I took a closer look though, I found a little spider jumping from leaf to leaf. Originally I was just going to capture her and let her go outside, but I got to thinking. I've never kept a spider before or anything like that, so why don't I give it a try? Prior to this, I had her housed in a different setup. She lived in there for about a month or so until one day I accidentally left the door open and she escaped into the animal room. By some miracle I was able to find her a few days later and she's lived in this enclosure ever since. I never thought I'd enjoy keeping a spider but here I am saying I've enjoyed keeping a spider. She's a very inquisitive creature, fun to watch, and believe it or not, very personable. If you're ever lucky enough to come across one in your house and you like keeping these sorts of animals, maybe give it a try sometime, I think you'd be surprised. Moving on from where we were previously is this large aquarium here. This is a 110 tall that rests on yet another custom DIY stand. It opens from the top to access the tank, has doors on the bottom to the sump, and everything frames in the tank. This gives the illusion that it's a piece of furniture as opposed to a glass box with a plastic frame on it. Inside of the tank lives a very special group of animals. A pair of Suriname toads that I've named Pancake and Flapjack. Pancake is much larger and typically has a more even, brighter coloration about her. Flapjack on the other hand is a bit smaller, has a darker and more splotched coloration. We named them as such because when we got them last year they were much flatter. Even though they are still kind of flat given their overall size, they've really filled in since last year. I didn't realize to what extent that was until I did the updated build here last week. I put them in this new tank though because it's more appropriate for their breeding behaviors. Although I don't know if they'll be successful, I've noticed Amplexus every now and again and they're almost always together, so maybe one day we'll get to see that happen. By the way, for those of you who didn't know, these are the toads that give birth out of their back. I know a lot of people cringe about it, but I think it's pretty interesting. Anyway, as for the rest of the tank, I was able to pull off this look using a Universal Rocks background. It's basically a really thin piece of rubber that looks like a rocky wall with vines all over it. I also added a few pieces of wood to mimic the look of tree roots. Using these materials allowed me to maximize the footprint and also get a really dramatic look. You'll also notice that I included leaf litter on the bottom of the tank. Since the toads mimic leaves when they bury down in them, you almost can't notice them unless you take a really close look. I just can't get enough of these creatures and that cute little face. I mean look at that thing and tell me you think otherwise. We'll skip over a few enclosures for now and come over here to the reptile rack. What you're seeing is a rack with four individual plywood enclosures on it. I designed it in a way that keeps everything separate while looking like a single cohesive unit. The main feature that made this possible was building the canopy into the stand as opposed to in the tanks. That way all of the lighting and other components outside of the tank are not isolated to a small area. The enclosures are all custom built out of wood and sealed on the inside with liquid rubber to make them waterproof. 
All four of them more or less use the same design, with minor modifications to accommodate the difference in size. The ones up top have swing open doors which allows for max visibility, and that's one of the reasons why I so avidly DIY my vivariums especially. If you look at the ones on the market a lot of times they have all these obstructions and ugly things that really distract from the view, whereas something like this you can look into the tank and see it in its entirety. Like the smaller one I showed earlier, these ones also include magnets. As such they'll lock on contact without using latches or anything of that nature. All three of them are outfitted with circulation fans overhead. They're set on timers to turn on throughout the day and keep air moving for the geckos. I also have LED light strips over the top for the plants and UVB lights for basking. I've kept these geckos with UVB on and off over the years. Traditionally speaking, since they're nocturnal, it was often viewed as unnecessary. I don't know to what extent they'll benefit from having this because it's not anything that I can see with my own eyes, but in reality, pretty much all reptiles are going to benefit from some amount of UV. So again, I don't really know how helpful or necessary this even is, but on my constant pursuit to provide better for my animals, I figured I might as well do it. I have a single new Caledonia gecko in all three of these tanks, and all of them have their own unique story. I think we'll start out on the right with Henry. This little guy is a crested gecko. He's so personable, and of the three, he appreciates my presence the most. Every night when it's time to care for them, he usually comes up to the front of the tank for attention. This isn't always the case, but he's the only one of the three that comes to me. And the funny thing is that I love him so much, but I actually never intended on getting a crested gecko. Now I have two of them, and a gargoyle gecko. Anyway, an opportunity arose where I was able to adopt him, so I did. He was a baby at the time, and really skittish. Roughly 8 years later and we formed a very special bond. He appears to genuinely like my presence and even likes pets. A lot of you often ask, how do I get these types of behaviors out of my animals? Well, it can only happen if you respect your animal's space, don't push your boundaries, and make sure they have positive experiences. You can do that by providing them with a proper enriching home, but also by spending time observing their behaviors. Even though they can't talk, you can learn a lot from your animals simply by watching. Being able to adopt and give better homes to animals that otherwise wouldn't get the love they deserve is something I try to do when I can, and another animal I did that for was Cynthia, the gargoyle gecko. Cynthia's story is a little different than Henry's though, because she lived with her previous owner for 5-6 to six years prior to joining our family. She had very little human interaction during that time, and it's really evident. She's essentially a wild animal that lives in this room. I've tried to work with her, providing positive interactions, nice homes, food, etc. Despite all of my efforts though, little progress has been made. I will say that she's not quite as flighty as she was a few years ago, but I don't think she appreciates my presence at all. Every now and again we'll lock eyes while I'm taking care of her, but it never takes long for her to retreat to one of her hiding places. I'll continue to be patient and work with her because the reality is that I'll probably have her for another 15 years or more. That said, I've pretty much accepted the fact that she might always be this way. Delilah on the other hand is the only one of the three that I bought for myself. I raised her up from a baby and now she's around 4 years old. She's not quite as excitable as Henry but in general she has a very calm demeanor about her. She doesn't flee at my presence and tolerates handling quite well. I don't think she craves it quite like Henry, but I will say that it appears she likes pets as well. I know there's no way that I can prove it, but I honestly think that they do. Delilah is extremely beautiful, especially when she's fired up. This typically happens at night when there's a spike in humidity after spraying. I keep all three of these geckos the same way and in the same size tanks. These all measure 24 inches long by 24 inches wide by 24 inches tall, which is a pretty good footprint. This gives them plenty of room to climb, jump, explore, and hide if they want to. I think oftentimes when we're keeping these animals, we think since they're arboreal we should go taller, and that definitely works, but a little bit of width they're going to appreciate as well. The tanks all more or less have the same plants as well. I put plenty of cryptanthus down in the bottom because they're really robust. I've also included pothos and falsoralia, which can both be found on New Caledonia where the geckos are from. I included some umbrella plants as well, which when combined with the false auralia, create a great canopy overhead which I think the geckos appreciate. Like the spider vivarium, these tanks include custom made backgrounds as well. I carved them out of foam and painted them using the same techniques. These combined with various types of driftwood and plants I think makes for a pretty natural look. 
The variety in these environments helps stimulate and enrich the animals, which facilitates more natural behaviors. Speaking of nature, I've designed these enclosures to function just like it. Down in the bottom is a thriving colony of isopods and springtails that do a number of things. They break down various organics ranging from these leaves to the animal's poop and uneaten food. In fact, when the geckos are done eating, I bury their food dishes, which are biodegradable, under the leaves. Here they're processed by the cleanup crew and turned into fertilizer for the plants. This creates a natural cycle which keeps the tanks clean with minimal effort. Other than adding new leaves, trimming the plants, and general care for the geckos, I really don't have to do much of anything. And that's the beauty of going bioactive. It's not always the best solution, but for small to medium animals like these geckos, it can be a really good option. Below those tanks is where I keep Houdini, my blotched king snake, and things are done a little bit differently down here. He too lives in a bioactive enclosure that's very similar to the ones you just saw. It has a custom carved and painted background, natural elements like leaf litter, plants, etc. The difference is though that Dean creates more waste than the geckos. And although the cleanup crew can and will process it, it takes much longer. The geckos poop won't last for more than a day or two, while Dean's would last for at least a week. This really isn't ideal, so whenever he does poop, I'll go in his tank and clean it out. Lucky for me, he usually goes in his custom-made water bowl. That way I can remove it without really disrupting much of anything. Doing it this way allows us to get the benefits of the cleanup crew, while also not allowing excess waste to spoil the tank. His tank is also different because it includes a ceramic heat emitter and no circulation fans. This isn't set up to be a humid environment, so air circulation isn't quite as important. Plus, his tank has side ventilation while the geckos don't. He also has some slate down in the bottom which collects heat from above that he can lay on at night for some belly warmth. The challenge with this one though is setting it up in a way to where he doesn't disrupt the plants. The solution was actually kind of easy though. I just made planter baskets and filled them with gravel so he can't move them. Dean is currently the oldest animal in the room and I've had him for about 14 years. I raised him up from a baby so he's very habituated to people. He doesn't bite and is generally really chill unless food's in the picture. He turns absolutely savage then, but otherwise he's a pretty calm and inquisitive snake. As such, I tried to fill his enclosure with a lot of things to stimulate his mind through exploration. I haven't done it yet, but at some point I want to get in his enclosure and rearrange things a little bit. Doing so will encourage his desire to explore, and it's something I should probably do more regularly. It was a lot easier to do in his old setup, and I noticed that it was something that boosted his curiosity. Certainly not a requirement, just a little anecdotal thing that I've picked up on over the years. I should also mention for those of you who are new here that shortly after I got him when I was young, he actually escaped from the tank. I hadn't seen him for many months, but one day my dad found him outside under a trash can. That happened because I didn't have clamps on the lid. Needless to say, I take proper precautions these days, and I have a lock on his sliding doors. Moving back over this way, we have my custom-built 600-gallon vivarium. Now, I wanted to show the other ones prior to this one because this uses the exact same design as those ones, but obviously it's much bigger. It's 6 feet wide, 2 feet from front to back, and 7.5 feet tall from floor to ceiling. I built it primarily out of reclaimed materials, so really the only thing I had to pay for was the glass. It includes a custom carved background like the previous ones, a ton of hardscape and other elements that make for a really cool sort of canopy feel, and obviously by looking at it, a ton of plants. I have a lot of incredible plants in here from string of turtles to various margravia, a batwing passion flower, and cebu blue pothos to name a few. As you would come to expect by now, it's set up to be bioactive and everything like that. Since I was working at such a large scale here, I really wanted to design this in a way that if you're walking around in the forest or something like that, couldn't you just see this right next to you? You're just walking next to these trees, all these plants and stuff growing on it. I don't know, that's what I wanted to create and I think I did a pretty decent job doing that. For now, it's the biggest enclosure in the room, but it's only a few months old, so I haven't stocked it yet. I can't wait to get it stocked though because the are gonna absolutely love this environment. I can picture them utilizing all of the climbing spaces, jumping around and different things like that. It's just gonna be a really cool thing to see. And this is actually a pretty easy environment to take care of. There are a few hiccups that I had to address early on in the process, but overall it's doing really well and I cannot wait to see how it progresses. Anyway, that's all for a different video though. For now, let's take a look at the 40 gallon rack over here. This was built using the same exact design from the Suriname toad rack. Again, I set it up so that all the aquariums look like they're framed in by the wood. 
It holds three 40 gallon breeder aquariums that house various incredible animals. The only thing about this one is I went a little bit overboard with the finishes because it was the first one that I did. So I'll probably address that at some point in the future so that it's a little bit more subtle to match the other ones. Anyway, up top here we have the Pea Puffer Jungle Aquascape. And even me just standing here with the lights and stuff, they're curious about what's going on. And that's one of the things to love about these animals, but we'll talk about that here in a little bit. For those of you who didn't follow the saga of this tank, it was a little bit of a rough go. It's been set up for around a year now, but I was having serious issues with algae at first. I just couldn't get it to stop overtaking the tank, and it made it look really terrible. The fish probably didn't carry either way, but I was so fed up with how it looked that I almost took it down completely and started from scratch. Good thing I didn't though because after several months of blacking out the tank and manually removing the algae, I got things dialed in and here we are now. I still have to get some more plants in here, but overall I really like the look and feel of it. And it really resembles the original vision that I had for this tank. When I was originally setting this up, it was really important to include a lot of plants and hardscape to create visual barriers for the fish. This houses 12 pea puffers, which can be temperamental towards each other. With enough space and visual barriers though, you shouldn't have any issues with that at all. The group that I have clearly has a dominance hierarchy, but regardless, they live peacefully together. I should mention that I resisted buying these for a really long time. Every time my wife and I would go into a fish store, she'd always want me to get these, and I just really wasn't feeling it because I know they're a little bit finicky at eating and that sort of thing, but eventually I decided to do it, and I'm really glad that I did. They're very personable, really inquisitive, and absolutely adorable. And as the name suggests, even when they're full grown, they're hardly bigger than a pea. That definitely adds to the appeal, but for such a small animal, they have big personalities. And they're absolutely savage when it comes to food. They fight over the worms and make a total mess. It's hilarious though. The only problem though is that they're picky eaters and will only eat bloodworms, brine, and mysis shrimp. That's all good and well, but lucky me, I'm allergic to all three of those things, especially bloodworms. Naturally, those are their favorite. <laughs> oh well, gotta do what you gotta do to make the buddies happy. Moving down, we have one of my all-time favorite builds in the room, the Firebelly Toad Paludarium. This is actually the second rendition of this build. A lot went into creating the look that you see here, but I think the results speak for themselves. The entire background and scape itself is built up using Dragonstone. Using that allowed me to create a really unique look that I think showcases these animals well. Behind the rocks on the background is an overflow box that spills over to create this moss drip wall. After some time to grow in, it looks absolutely lush and serves as a hangout spot for the toads. Every now and again when I peer into the tank, I'll see them sitting up in this area and just looking over the entirety of the scape. If you look up front here, I also built the islands out of dragonstone. Simply put, I built up a ring of stones and filled up the interior with a substrate. There I was able to add the plants, driftwood, and all of the elements that you see here. The end result is something that looks incredible, functions really well, and looks unique. This is probably actually the lowest maintenance thing in the entire animal room. I've maybe done two or three water changes on it in the year that it's been set up, and I probably didn't even need to do those. Anyway, the whole reason that I designed it like this was not to look cool, it's actually for a functional purpose. I wanted the toads to be able to have barriers and separate areas to hang out because they can get sort of temperamental towards each other. They're not the only things living in this tank though. If we move down into the water feature, you'll see a plethora of movement. This area also includes a few plants, leaf litter, and other components that add texture and interest. You'll find a breeding group of white cloud mountain minnows swimming through all of these details. There's also a bit of a deformed zebra danio that was mixed in with them when I bought them. There's also some ram's horn snails, a mono shrimp, and red cherry shrimp. All of this combined together makes for a cool little display in the water feature, but the stars of this tank are of course the fire-bellied toads. I've actually had them for around 10 years now, and they're absolute characters. They debop all around the tank, bicker among each other, and will jump all over the tank to get whatever I feed. That said, the vibe is pretty big when these guys are chilling out, and I mean if I was their size and hanging out in there, I'd probably be doing the same thing. Frogs in general are my favorite type of animal, and these ones are no exception. They're just so much fun to have around. Moving down to the third and final tank, we have a biotope style aquarium. Several months back, I bought a group of Emeka Splendens, or the Butterfly Split Fin, which is an incredible fish. They originate from a very small area within the Emeka River Basin in Mexico. 
Unfortunately, these fish are practically extinct in the wild due to habitat loss and activities around the river. They are being bred in captivity though, so even if they were to go extinct, they'll live on in the fish keeping hobby. And just to clarify, these are not wild caught animals, and any specimens that you're going to find are not going to be wild caught, they're going to be captive bred. Anyway, because of the state of this fish, I thought it'd be cool to set them up in a biotope style aquarium to give homage to where they come from. I did some research to determine what type of materials are in the waters that they come from, and I did my best to replicate that environment. The water that they come from is very hard due to limestone, so I used exclusively limestone rocks and limestone sand to create the majority of their scape. I did have to take liberty with the driftwood though and used some that's not found in their area. I really wanted to include it though because I think it helps create that riverbank type of feel that I was going for. It's planted exclusively with hornwort which can be found in the areas that they're from. Since I set this up it's really grown in and kind of taken on a life of its own. Originally I was trying to manicure it and make it look a certain way, but I thought to myself, you know what, if this is supposed to be a biotype style aquarium, I should just kind of let it do its own thing. The plants have covered the top of the tank and kind of frame everything in, in a way that looks pretty cool. They're always zooming around, exploring the rocky crevices, and have really cool personalities. I wish these were a more common fish in the hobby because they're pretty easy to keep, have a really unique look about them, and as I said earlier, just have awesome personalities. These are live bears, so just like others, they'll readily breed in captivity. We probably gotta wait till some of the smaller ones reach maturity though, but I can't wait to see that happen. Moving over, we have yet again another rack, and this one houses two 75 gallon tanks. The one on the bottom though, you'll notice is empty, and this is where the Suriname toads were previously. If you got any ideas on what you wanna see in here, let me know down in the comments. Let's take a look up top though and see what Samson is up to. Samson's my 5 year old giant African bullfrog. He's a total character, will eat anything he can fit in his mouth, and is a total unit. At roughly 7 inches long, he's not quite full grown, but he's pretty big. He's got probably about another 2 inches or so to grow until he maxes out. Despite this size, the 75 gallon tank is more than adequate for him because they don't move around very much. He'll spend a few weeks in the water at a time until he makes his way up to the land area. He'll sit in a single spot up there until he poops or pees, where he'll then make his way back down to the water and the cycle continues. This makes it easy for me because if he was up here and moved into the water, I know that means it's time for me to clean up this area. I would say though that on average, he probably spends more time in the water. And the habits I just described are what I designed the tank around. I wanted him to have a decent sized water feature, but I also included a few areas where he can hide within it and feel secure. I also of course have the land area where he can go to dry out a bit or dig a hole and relax. This is another setup where I didn't really think it made sense to go the DIY route because I really wanted to maximize the space within here. Although I do have some plants in here, they don't look quite as nice as they could because he's not so light on his feet. Although he'd be fine to live in here for his entire life, I think at some point I'd like to upgrade him to a bigger setup. It's not going to happen anytime soon, but I could definitely see him in something maybe twice this size or three times this size and just go absolutely crazy with it. Maybe we could get him a girlfriend too, who knows? And moving over to the final setup in the entire room, my 350 gallon paludarium. This is the second largest tank in all of the room and it's probably one of my favorites as well. It's a very elaborate setup and one of the only tanks in the room that I didn't build myself or heavily modify to fit my vision and the animal's needs. Instead I teamed up with custom aquariums to design this tank. Or maybe I should say that I came up with the design and they built it for me. Either way it's here now. The whole reason I went through all of that to make this tank was for my silver dollars. At this point I've had them now for at least 6 years and I always wanted to keep them in a planted aquarium. If you know anything about silver dollars though, they're really not a planted tank type of fish. They'll just kind of go through and shred it all up. There is a loophole though. Just put all the plants above the rim. And that's exactly what I did. Since the tank is so large, I was able to go with a lot of larger plants like peace lilies, monstera, and calathea to name a few. I used a lot of driftwood to create shelves of sorts just under the waterline for the plants to rest on. Doing this allowed me to get all of this riparian growth. It also acts like an overhang and sort of like a riverbank that deters the fish from jumping. That's one of the reasons why there's also a foot of space between the top of the water and the top of the front piece of glass. Had I taken the water all the way up to the glass or the glass down to the water, the fish definitely would have jumped out. 
The other option would have been to have opening doors from the front or something like that, but I just thought that it would have taken away from the look. So all of this allowed me to, in a roundabout way, create a planted tank for my silver dollars. And in some ways, I gotta say that I probably like this better than a traditional aquarium. There's just something about the plants bursting out of the top that creates this really unique look that makes you see past the tank itself and see it as more than just an aquarium or a paludarium or something like that. I could have stopped there, but I also included a drip wall in the background. This adds another layer of depth and interest that sets the tank apart. On some areas of this drip wall are dense patches of moss which look absolutely incredible. Over time it will continue creeping around and further naturalize the look. And although the tank is being filtered by a sump underneath, I'd have to wager that pretty much the majority of the filtration is being done by these plants. Since they're so large and established, they're absolutely demolishing any excess nutrients in the water. Because of all of this, I was able to stock this tank pretty heavily. As you could probably tell, that's not really how I do things around here, but this tank is an exception. And I gotta say that I honestly don't have any clue how many fish are actually in here. It's somewhere in the 120 to 150 range, if I had to guess. There's of course the group of silver dollars I mentioned earlier, a few lace catfish, a bristlenose pleco, some ancient pro gourami, congo tetras, black tail hemiotis, a brown ghost knife fish named Maxwell, a breeding colony of bronze corydoras, and a large school of at least 50 long fin serpa tetras. As I said earlier, I'm really not too crazy about long finned fish, but the opportunity came up to where I could get them, so I did. I will say though that their mobility doesn't appear to be affected much at all. The neat thing about them though is that I was actually able to catch them myself at the fish wholesaler. These are known to be an avid fin nipper, but if kept in large enough schools, like this one, then they'll bicker amongst each other and leave all of the other fish alone. Thus, I'm able to keep them in this tank without any issues. It might sound like a ridiculous group of fish because, I mean it is, but they actually work pretty well together. My favorite fish in the entire tank though is Maxwell, the brown ghost knife fish. I don't know if I'll even be able to get footage of him because he's very elusive. He pops out at night to get food and disappears till the next day. He's got to be close to about 8 inches at this point, so where he hides, I have no idea. Your guess is as good as mine. I really like the overall look and feel of this tank because it's much different than what you would typically see. I think it's a great way to really push the boundaries of this hobby and show what's possible. And believe it or not, it's actually really easy to take care of. Much like all of the other aquariums in the room, it gets about a 30% water change once a month. And that's pretty much it. And that's the animal room as of December 2021. I hope you all enjoyed the tour. I definitely had a fun time going around showing you all the updates on everything because it's been a while since we've done it and I just couldn't be happier with how everything's turning out down here. It's been a long time coming to get a lot of the animals into these setups and to just get this overall cohesive look but I think things are finally coming around full circle. I'm working on a lot of other big projects behind the scenes. The 150 cube, we got to do something with this 75 gallon and I'm working on some tanks to go above the Suriname toads so stay tuned for all of that and you know some nights when I come down here and I just look around I just I'm in awe by it all I, I feel so lucky and blessed and humbled that I get to do this for a living and I have all of you to thank for it I just I so appreciate your continued support over all the years watching commenting liking subscribing all that stuff and I just can't thank you enough uh, but that's all I got for you in this one. Again, I hope you all enjoyed the tour. Let me know what tank is your favorite, what you want to see next. And until next time, Serpa Squad, take care and peace.